So as Herman said, he said he had an extra challenge this year in, pu in putting things together, but we certainly appreciate the time and effort he, that it takes to, to pull something like this together. I'm delighted to be here in Seoul with all of you, um, and want to take a, 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 about a 25 minutes here at the end of our teaching session to go over psychological aspects of these disorders. The reason, the reason we want to talk about this is because that about 30% about 30 of patients um, in tertiary centers will have um, significant anxiety, depressive, or um, functional um, uh, disorders that, that are part of their presentation. And if you go with comorbidities, that number can, can reach well in, as, as many as half. So we're going to take a look at uh, some specific psychiatric disorders that cause vestibular symptoms, talk about a couple of functional presentations, um, and describe what we mean by that, um, uh, go over a, a classification of um, persistent, uh, or persistent postural desk perceptual dizziness, which has uh, been referred to a couple of times, and then talk about some emerging pathophysiologic data, and there are some um, studies looking at um, processes that occur across a number of um, uh, anxiety and uh, functional disorders. And the biggest thing that I think is that our, our principle in, in reviewing this is the one written there by Carl Westfall some 140 some years ago. And that is that our job is to really explain what's going on for patients and if we don't pay attention to the, to the behavioral aspects, we really can't give them a full explanation um, for what's happening to them. All right. Um, so, the, so the Neanderthal that, um, that Adolfo mentioned um, is uh, the 1870s in Germany. Um, and we had a debate back then, 145 years ago, um, that really is still with us today. And that is how much of things that appear to be behavioral in nature are neurologic, how much of it is psychiatric, and how much of it is something in between. And the three things that you see in front of you um, were three different syndromes um, that German physicians wrote about, and they were all describing the same thing. And that is, patients who had difficulty going into the town squares of German villages, that's where the marketplace was in the 1870s, and a number of people were overwhelmed by that. They felt disoriented, they felt dizzy, um, they felt anxious, um, and the question was, what was going on? Um, and on the left side, Plotschwindel, or vertigo in a public place or square, was considered to be a neurologic process. Um, that, that, that it was neuropthalmologic was the problem. It was a visual, it was a neurologic visual problem. On the right was thought to be, the, that's amyl cortis on the right, was thought to be completely psychological. Panic attacks were the problem. And in the middle, um, Carl Westfall um, described it more as, as an, uh, a combination of behavioral and neurologic processes, part of one process, as he said. Spatial orientation, conscious control of locomotion, threat responses, all part of one thing. They also recognized and actually recommended that patients um, uh, treat, it, treat themselves by habitual exposure, uh, essentially the forerunner of vestibular rehabilitation, if you are vestibular habituation, and even, and even noticed that this condition, this type of a situation, could be triggered by otologic illnesses, especially in people who had anxious temperaments. So a lot of the features that they describe there are things that we still are dealing with today. Um, and the question is, if they had it all before them 140 years ago, what happened? And the answer to that is the 20th century happened. Um, and in the 20th century, otology, psychiatry, and neurology went their own separate ways. Agoraphobia became strictly a psychiatric illness, lost its space-motion context, um, and then we developed a dichotomy where people either had vestibulopathies on the one hand um, or they had psychogenic dizziness on the other. Never the two shall meet and they were off in different directions. Now the problem with that that plagued the entire 20th century in lots of areas of medicine is that there's a faulty logic to that. There's a, an entirely faulty logic to the idea that there are medically explained and medically unexplained symptoms, and here's why. There's only one time that B equals not A. And so I've been on the receiving end of this person's psychogenic because we've done all the tests and I can't find anything, so they must be psychogenic, they're yours. Um, but here's the problem, is B equals not A in one and only one situation. That's when all of A is known, all of B is known, they don't overlap, and there is no other. That's the only situation 
in which we can say B equals not A. But if we, look, if we think about it, in neurotology, we also have the unknowns. I mean, not so very long ago, vestibular migraine was an unknown. Canal dehiscence was an unknown. Um, and the other thing is that our division between them is more like this. There's an overlap between A's and B's. The boundaries between A's and B's are uncertain. And so under those circumstances, it's absolutely impossible to define something by what it's not. So we cannot say that something is psychological simply because we don't know what it is. So there's an alternative, and this is something that Mariana Dietrich and Thomas Brandt and I just recently suggested, and it's not, and we, weren't, we didn't make it up, we actually learned it probably more from our GI colleagues who are, much, who are further ahead than this, and that is that we really want to think of things in structural and cellular terms, structural problems like Meniere's disease, cellular ones like migraine, uh, psychiatric ones, anxiety and depressive disorders, but also functional syndromes, syndromes that are marked primarily by a change in functioning of, the, of an organ system, not by a structural deficit. But there's an also very important other change that occurs with that, and that is when you look at the B equals not A idea, as most of us were trained in the 20th century, that's a rule out approach. I'm going to do this test to rule out this problem, this test to rule out that problem, this test to rule out that problem. When I ruled it all out, then what's left in the bucket is psychogenic or psychosomatic or whatever you want to call it. This newer approach requires us to think in terms of rule in. If I have a structural lesion, um, and there may, there, but there may be more to the problem. It doesn't tell me whether or not I have a psychiatric problem or whether or not I have a functional one. A patient I had came in and I said, she sat down and I said, how are things going? And she started crying. And I said, what's the problem? She said, well, I just had a new grandbaby. And I said, well, how's that a problem? And she said, because I can't hold him, I'll drop him. This was a person with Meniere's disease. She has a structural lesion. The reason she's not holding her baby is only partially due to her Meniere's disease. It's also due to the phobia that she has about her dizziness. And without understanding that she has an overlapping problem, we're never going to get her to hold her grandbaby. So the structural, so, so having one of the problems in one of these buckets doesn't tell us about what the others are unless we ask the questions. This is what we mean by functional. Again, we're going back to the 19th century. So in 1831, this is the idea of what a functional disorder was, and that is it's a change in the mode of action of an organ system not related to structural or now, as we look at more cellular problems, not related to cellular ones either. So let's, let's, um, let's go through this in a little bit more detail. Um, we can reduce psychiatric problems when it comes to vestibular um, uh, patients to just five things. That's good, the DSM-4 is about, or 5 is about that thick. I'll, I need to deal with that, all of you don't. Um, and so we'll go through each of these five things uh, in a moment. But one of the big things, again, from this idea of ruling things in rather than ruling them out, is that psychiatric syndromes can be a cause of vestibular symptoms. They can also be a consequence of vestibular symptoms, and they can coexist with other problems, as in, the, as in the woman I just told you about. So when we think about psychiatric problems, we have to think about them not as in the leftover, but as what do they run with, um, what, they, what might they explain, and what they, might they be a consequence of. All right, let's take them one at a time. The first psychiatric syndrome that can produce vestibular symptoms is, or panic attacks, so acute anxiety attacks. Most of these present with chest symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, but the second most common presentation is dizziness and lightheadedness. Um, and in fact, it can produce a feeling of unsteadiness and even subtle vertigo. So patients can feel a spinning sense in the midst of a panic attack. They're not going to have the rapid spinning of BPPV or Meniere's disease uh, or Meniere's attack, but they can describe spinning. The, the, the important thing about a panic attack is it comes on fast and it goes away um, pretty quickly. There's lots of reasons for people to have panic attacks. It's not such a big deal that you all could sort those out, but rather just recognize that someone is having panic symptoms in the middle of an acute bout of vestibular symptoms. And the panic attack can occur with or without something else. People can have a Meniere's attack with panic. They can have a vestibular migraine attack with panic or can have panic by itself as the cause of their symptoms. But again, it's an acute, sudden onset, potentially lingering, but acute, sudden onset with sweating, palpitation, shaking, queasiness, um, autonomic, essentially an autonomic storm, if you will. 
The second thing is chronic dizziness. These are the people that we would think of as worriers. They worry about everything. They fuss about this, they fuss about that. They worry about, oh, we can't do that, something bad's gonna happen. I don't think we should do that. You know, and that's the worry wart. We all know who they are, and that can produce a background level of lightheaded, fuzzy, dizzy, unsteady sensations, not so much vertigo, but unsteadiness and dizziness. Again, with or without structural or functional problems. And then there's fear, fear of falling or fear of dizziness. And the reason that this is so important is because a person with a fear of falling is at increased risk of falling. Um, and so the patients with a fear of falling, because they stiffen up, because they lurch from one thing to another as they're walking around, because they look at their feet while they're walking instead of looking at other things, are at increased risk of the very thing they're afraid of. So it's a perfect vicious circle. Um, and especially this is, is, is common in older people who don't do well when they fall. Um, and so identifying the fact that someone is afraid of falling and, helping, and getting them especially to a physical therapist to help, with, help them with that can reduce significantly their risk for additional morbidity. Now you have all seen these patients. You may not know what they had, but this is, this is the person who has illness anxiety. Um, and this is the person who's always vigilant about their body. Oh, there was the dizziness again. Um, uh, wait, 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 I had a different kind of dizziness today. I, I, I need to tell you about it. Um, catastrophic worry about what the consequences might be. And most importantly, from the clinician's standpoint, very difficult to reassure them about what's going on. You can do a perfectly good evaluation, really nail the diagnosis just fine, and they still have 100 a, a different questions about what's going on. This is a person who has a, 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 an entity called illness anxiety. It is, in, and, in, and importantly, it, it, it exists in about 12% of patients, regardless of what their vestibular diagnosis is. Um, and the treatment for this is not to try and reassure them that doesn't work, but to identify the fact that they're afraid. Um, and and um, there are specific psychological treatments for it. So that one more test, that bargaining, well, we'll do the MRI again one more time and then, and then that'll reassure you, that actually doesn't work very well. And then lastly is depression. Um, depression can cause nonspecific dizziness. Usually it's a vague type of dizziness. But also importantly, one study from Japan showed that depression can be a harbinger or a warning that, or I'm sorry, dizziness can be a harbinger or a warning that depression is coming. It may be the first somatic symptom of a, of a brewing depression. Okay, so the question is, what do you all have, what is, an, an, from a neurologic standpoint or an otologic standpoint, what's your obligation for these patients? And, and you do have an obligation because the patients come to you, they don't come to me first. Um, and the big thing is just to recognize those five key features. Patients having acute anxiety, are they worriers, are they afraid of falling, are they fussy about their health, and are they depressed? Um, if you pick those things up and help the patients understand that it's part of the morbidity that they're facing, you can leave the details to psychiatrists or psychologists, but you've got to get the patients to a psychiatrist or a psychologist to help you. There's also um, these screening tools. The first, the first set is particularly useful. Those are available for free download. The, the Pfizer, the drug company Pfizer owns the copyright, but makes them available free of charge. They can be downloaded in about 80 different languages um, right, off of that, uh, right off of that website. And the scoring, is, the scoring is very simple and straightforward. These are self-reports, a few questions the patients can, can answer. Um, in the waiting room to let, you, to let you know whether or not they have some morbidity with it. The alternative is to use the hospital anxiety and depression scale. All of those have been used in otologic research in patients with dizziness, so we know that they're, they're quite helpful. Again, from a treatment standpoint, your job is to help the patients understand that, this, that the psychiatric morbidity is part of what's going on for them, and then our job is to treat them. And fortunately, um, we're in a position in which all of our standard therapies for panic disorder, generalized anxiety, and depression work well for patients who have otologic problems. Um, a lot of medications list dizziness as a side effect. We don't really worry that much about it um, because we don't normally exacerbate dizziness in patients who have otologic illnesses. Um, so that the tools that we have available, both medications and psychotherapies, um, work quite nicely. And physical therapy also can help to reduce psychiatric morbidity, improving balanced confidence and counteracting avoidance strategies that patients develop. Okay, let's go back then to the functional side of things. Again, what we're talking about is, is illnesses that may be, or syndromes that may be driven mostly by a change in functioning of one or more aspects of the uh, vestibular system.
Um, and and um, a, a century after um, these were first debated in, in, in uh, Germany, we started to have a recurrence of writing about it in the literature. Um, supermarket syndrome, space phobia, if you look supermarket syndrome and, and fear of the marketplace, that's about the same observations of, of physicians 100 years apart. And then we had these four syndromes or four symptoms, four complex symptoms or syndromes um, reported out in, in the last 30 years. Now, these, um, here's the core features of these from phobic postural vertigo on through chronic subjective dizziness. Um, they are look, looking at these syndromes, looking at these circumstances in slightly different ways, but there are things that, that coalesce and come together um, around them, and from those key features, from those overlapping features, um, we have developed the, the definition of the syndrome of persistent postural perceptual dizziness, which I'll take you through in just a minute. But let's line this up a different way. Let's look at it this way. As Adolfo mentioned, visual vertigo is not a diagnosis. It's really best thought of as a complex symptom that can occur in a variety of different contexts. And Rolf Jacob would say the same thing about space motion discomfort. It's a symptom that it's, 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 it, it has a variety of places that it can occur and triggers that can bring it on. In contrast, phobic postural vertigo and chronic subjective dizziness always were considered to be diagnosable conditions um, that we would identify and treat. So there are some differences in the way, the way that the people looked at these, but also they share some similar features. And if we first look across the symptoms, we're talking about a predominance of dizziness, unsteadiness, and a wobbling or swaying, bouncing kind of vertigo, um, not spinning round and round. Um, that they have a set of triggers, including vestibular syndromes, but also psychological distress and other medical conditions that can trigger dizziness. So things like faints or near faints, adverse reactions to medications that cause dizziness. So things that can trigger an acute onset of vestibular symptoms. Um, they also share various provocations. Um, Mo external motion stimuli, motion of the person themselves, and postural symptoms. Um, and then there was really a, some differences, though, on, on whether, I'm sorry, let me, let me come back to that. And there also, in terms of time course, was a sense that some of these things can be chronic, but also situational. So there's sort of a background level to this that can develop, but patients still be vulnerable to the circumstances that they're in for flares of symptoms. And then there were some differences in whether or not some, some psychological features were components of these, um, these phenomenon or comorbidities of the phenomenon, and we haven't settled that just yet. But in looking at those, the, uh, the subcommittee, the behavioral subcommittee of the Barani Classification uh, Project um, has developed this definition of, uh, for persistent postural perceptual dizziness. So it's, it's a syndrome, diagnosable syndrome or, or disorder um, that captures some of the core elements of the 30 years of, of observations and, and work on, on, on the precursors. This is a, a syndrome of dizziness, unsteadiness, and non-spitting vertigo that's present for three months or more. Um, it's present most of the time. That doesn't mean every moment of every day. Um, and it tends to wax and wane um, uh, throughout the day. And by most of the time, we mean more than 15 of every 30 days, so more than 50% of the time. And again, sy symptoms don't have to be continuous, but they do have to be present when they are present for extended periods. The other thing is that even though there's a background level of symptoms, there are three factors that seem to exacerbate symptoms. That is being upright, walking or standing, sometimes sitting unaided, sitting, sitting unsupported. Um, active or passive motion, so the person's own movements are being moved about in conveyances, and then exposure to moving or complex visual stimuli. So there's the visual vertigo part of it. Again, a symptom of this disorder, um, not unique to this disorder. And then there are, seem to be some variations. Some people are more sensitive to the postural symptoms. Some people more sensitive to the visual ones. And so, um, and so even though all parts of this are, have, need to be present for the diagnosis, they don't have to be equal in, in um, severity. And one other thing is, I run into, an, into patients especially who have various jobs in which their employers will say, OK, well, if this is a dizzy patient, we'll just give them a desk job. Um, but in our world, where we have to use um, screens a lot, 
mobile devices and other things, precision visual activity, just sitting and working on a computer, especially data entry and those kinds of things, can be very provocative for these patients. Okay. Now, normally speaking, patients who develop triple PD will, will describe a history of an acute vertiginous episode. Um, and then I say, as I got better, as you know, it was two years ago, I had vertigo, took to bed for two days, got better in a couple of weeks, but then it changed. And I didn't, wasn't spinning anymore, but now I'm just dizzy all the time. And they'll describe that transition from an acute triggering event to, uh, to triple PD. Some patients will have more of a stuttering onset. So they'll have, you know, a little bit of symptoms and then it'll fade and it'll come back again and it'll fade and, until it eventually consolidates. And that's more common in patients who have recurrent triggers like vestibular migraine attacks. And then there are a group of, of patients who have a more insidious onset, usually associated with a slow onset trigger, uh, like a down meat nystagmus syndrome, as, as Adolfo mentioned, um, you know, where patients slowly have an onset of a neurotologic illness and then develop a high level of visual, visual and, and, and motion provocations on top of it. I actually have a, a, a separate slide on that breaks down these triggers, um, so I'll show you that in just a minute. And then this is the, the other thing, importantly, criteria E says that symptoms aren't better accounted by other diseases or disorders, but that doesn't mean that triple PD runs by itself. It can run with other things. So it's not a diagnosis of exclusion. It's not a leftover category. It's a diagnosis that you meet when patients fulfill, or that you make when patients fulfill the criteria, um, and it may or may not be present with other ongoing neurotologic difficulties. All right, so here's a breakdown. This is from a study we did on chronic subjective dizziness, but our expectation is that the differential diagnosis of triggering events will be similar um, as we repeat this in triple PBD. And if you look at that, you've got anxiety disorders that can trigger uh, dizziness. You have acute vestibular syndromes, uh, peripheral or central and then neurologic illnesses including migraine, traumatic brain injury, whiplash, orthostatic intolerance, um, and then a collection of other medical conditions, um, all of which share the, the ability to trigger acute vertigo, unsteadiness, or dizziness. And those are the triggering events um, that can um, set off uh, the triple PD. Um, we'll go through these one at a time uh, quickly, one slide for each, but as investigators have looked at behavioral morbidity in patients with dizziness. We're really beginning to accumulate a story that we can tell about what's happening to them physiologically with regard to posture, visual or um, uh, somatosensory dependence, where the threat system is acting to, to promote and, and sustain these, and then um, some processes of, of higher cortical integration, that, that perceptual reflexive dissociation is, is from our colleagues in London, um, and that is that, there's a dis that, that perceptual processes and reflexive processes may not, be, may not be coordinated so well, so reflexive postural control and our sense of stability may not be as, as, as lined up um, as we would want them to be. So here's an example, there are actually a lot, there's actually a lot of research on this aspect of postural control changes. On the top, you see normal individuals. On the left side, standing at ground level, this is a posture graphic tracing. And, and then the other one standing 10 feet or 3.2 meters in the air. And what you can see is the person stiffens up. And on the bottom, what you can see is a study out of Switzerland um, in patients with, with chronic subjective dizziness, again, uh, um, a precursor of triple PD. But these studies have also been done in phobic postural vertigo. And what you can see is it looks like there's two patterns. The one is that stiffening pattern where the person is, is stiffer in walking about. The second is a stiffening one, but also with, with more sort of this sort of functional swaying like this, so almost as if they become too stiff and, and, then, and then wiggle about much more. Um, people would look at that and say, oh, that's all functional. Um, and, and not in a dismissive way, but yes, it's, fun it's a functional change in postural control. This is another way of looking at um, somatosensory and, and, and uh, visual dependence. In blue are, are patients with triple PD. Uh, in red are patients with, who have recovered from an acute vestibular syndrome um, and in, uh, in the light teal or in the teal are normal individuals. And what you can see is that um, on the left side, in those, in those easier tasks, the visual tasks, either with eyes closed or with moving visual surround on the sensory organization test, on the equitest, test, 
you can see elements, uh, evidence that patients don't perform as well under those visual challenges. So some evidence that, that they are visually dependent. Um, and then more difficult challenges uh, or difficult tasks um, performing about the same level um, as those who have, have recovered without symptoms. So what used to be called or what's still called by many people the across the board pattern thought to be quote a physiologic but really may well reflect the physiology that we're beginning to understand a little bit better about patients with this particular functional problem. So what role does anxiety play in this? And, and here's, an, here's a study from a decade ago now um, in which patients were followed prospectively for a year, captured within the first few days of onset of vestibular neuritis. Two-thirds of them recovered without symptoms. One-third of them continued to be symptomatic. Vestibular testing showed that the majority had compensated just fine from a peripheral standpoint. Um, and so the question is, if they'd compensated for their peripheral loss, why were they still dizzy, and what predicted dizziness? And the answer was being acutely anxious. So the person who has an acute vestibular insult becomes quite anxious and caught up with it is one who's likely to transition to persistent dizziness. And that's been shown not just in this study, but in four other research studies that have either been published or will be published soon. Um, all showing the same pathway. So it looks like that process of going through an acute anxious phase is a setup for, these, for this persistence of functional shift to more visual dependence, more stiff postural control that ends up with triple PD. And this is the first study, the first fMRI study of triple PD was published um, last fall. Um, and what you see is key areas here in the brain, the PIVC, and visual areas, and, the, the, uh, and, and this was in response to a VEMP type of a click compared to patients who were normal controls. And these areas of the brain are decreased in their functional reactivity to the VEMP click, and perhaps equally importantly, have less integration with one another um, than normal. They're not talking to one another as much as they would be in normal circumstances. Okay, so that gives us a model that looks something like this. Triggering events, shift to visual dependence or somatosensory dependence, which is necessary when the vestibular system is acutely out. Um, but the expectation normally would be that people would recover. Their neurotologic system would recover. They'd recover medically and psychologically. But in the face of an anxious temperament, in the face of acute anxiety, patients seem to persist in these high-risk high postural control strategies and then when faced with environmental motion cues, um, have a vicious circle that, that keeps them there, potentially with additional phobic or other anxious morbidity. So quickly through treatment. These treatment studies are not for triple PD. That's, well, actually, this one is. This is the only one of the treatment studies that enrolled patients specifically with triple PD. The other ones I'm going to mention come from either uh, phobic postural vertigo or chronic subjective dizziness. Um, but physical therapy can work. This was a one-shot deal. We send a lot of patients from Mayo Clinic back to very small little towns of 100 people or two, you know, uh, uh, 200 kilometers from anything else. And so they have to fend for themselves. And so we have one shot to try and help them with their, with their um, vestibular habituation. And the majority of them found that understanding what triple PD is, understanding what fear of falling is, is helpful. And that performing the exercises, even though they're on their own to do it, um, still helped us a little bit more than half of them. Um, the SSRIs, the, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, are also useful. Uh, you can see that the, this is an example of, of these medications can cut the symptom level in about half. What that means is it takes it from an impairing level on the dizziness handicap inventory to a nagging level that's not impairing. So it doesn't eliminate the illness, but it, but it, um, it substantially improves functioning. And there have been eight open-label studies incorporating these medicines um, conducted both in the U.S. and Japan. And psychotherapy is an interesting, um, this is an, an, an interesting story, and that is that if, if triple PD, or in this case phobic postural vertigo, is well-established and chronic, cognitive behavioral therapy does not work. If, though, it's caught early, and that second line is a study from Australia, 
in which patients were captured within eight weeks of their acute vestibular crisis and given just three sessions of psychotherapy, just three visits with a, psych with a psychologist, and that was enough to substantially prevent the development of, um, of a net case, in this case, chronic subjective dizziness. So catching, it, catching these patients during that time of acute transition into the functional changes before they have a chance to solidify seems to be a, a possibility for primary prevention. So in conclusion then, we have our structural and cellular disorders. Those are ones that we're pretty familiar with. Um, and then also we have psychiatric disorders, specifically the anxiety and depressive disorders that I talked about. But in the third category um, are functional disorders, and the triple PD being the one that we've defined explicitly. But looking at this three, three, some three um, uh, oval diagram allows us to place other symptoms and processes, such as, for example, the visual dependence of, of visual vertigo, which starts with a structural lesion and, and moves to this, this functional change in visual dependence, or the phobic behaviors of phobic postural vertigo, which overlap the functional syndromes, symptoms of, of triple PD with, um, with those, those, phobic, those phobic responses. So it does help us to begin to think more about um, identifying what's happening with patients in a, in a more complete context. The five syndromes again, panic attacks, the generalized worrier, the person who's afraid of falling, the person who's all caught up in their illness, and the one who's depressed. Those are the things you need to know. If you can send those folks to us, we'll figure them out and, and help you to, um, to sort them out. Um, importantly, as you're educating patients about this, dizziness can be both a cause and consequence of their symptoms and can strongly influence the handicap that patients have when they have other um, neurotologic disorders. Um, the education starts with everybody who sees the patients um, and, and, then, and then we can treat them. And then now um, we have a formal diagnosis for triple PD based on observations made 140 years ago um, and, and research done over the last 30 years. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.